made a major reshuffle of his cabinet members. Some of the most senior leaders in both military and government have been replaced in recent days. As especially headlined was the foreign minister Kuleba was the the latest in a flurry of so-called resignations. Uh, that typically means they were fired and they were uh, asked to give their resignation, which seemed to have happened. Uh, but it's not just uh, the uh, Kuleba. There's actually as that. Uh, article was pointing out there. Gary, if you could throw that back up for just one second. Uh, it was uh, also uh, the head of the state property fund, uh, top official in Zelensky's presidential office have all quit within the last day or so. Uh, there's actually quite a few officials on top of that. To help break down some of this, we have the eminent uh, international relations master. That's the title I've now given him. Uh, Professor John Mearsheimer, University of Chicago. Uh, Professor, as always, welcome back to the show. Glad to be here, Danny. But listen, you know, I want to let's get get into this right away because it, it's you know, making a lot of headlines, really caught a lot of people by surprise, uh, especially this late in the war that suddenly you're going to change horses on these major issues. You may recall that last year uh, they had a big change of the military or actually it was early this year. I'm sorry. When they had the, what was Zeluzhny, who was running their military, was replaced by Sersky, uh, and that was kind of on the military. You maybe can understand that they wanted to change directions or so. But now, then, what do you make just first of all categorically about this big sudden change where they get rid of lots of guys all at the same time, especially the foreign minister? I think it's done for public relations purposes. It just doesn't matter. This one's going to be settled on the battlefield. I mean, the idea that they're going to bring in new policymakers, a new foreign minister who has a new way of bringing this war to a conclusion or altering the course of the war is not a serious argument. The same thing is true with uh, the situation that obtained when Zeluzhny was replaced by Sierski. Did that matter? Has the war been fought in a different manner? Has it had any difference, made any difference uh, regarding the outcome? The answer is no. And this isn't going to matter either. And and what does that tell you, uh, I guess, bigger picture about what uh, the, the uh, President Zelensky is trying to get done here? What is his intent? Because uh, about a week ago, or maybe it was less than a week ago, he fired his chief of the Air Force uh, ostensibly because they lost one of their new F-16s. And certainly you can understand why that was an embarrassment. But to fire the guy who's been running your Air Force from the whole time because of one apparent a a um, accident here or whatever actually happened, we still don't know for sure. But when you fired this guy and you fired this guy and now all of a sudden you fired your foreign minister and a bunch of other people, what does that tell you about the mental state or the mental position anyway of Zelensky? Well, first of all, they are desperate. Uh, because they're losing the war and they have no way of turning things around. Uh, and what Zelensky is doing is he's pursuing a number of policies that are designed to convey to his public and to the West that he's in control and that he has ways of fixing the problems that Ukraine faces. But who who has studied this war, seriously believes that firing the head of the Air Force is going to make any difference on the survivability of F-16s. Who believes that getting rid of one general and replacing him with another general is going to make any difference? And the same thing goes with the foreign minister. I mean, please tell me what's going to happen as a result of this firing. Please tell me who's going to replace the foreign minister and uh, change the course of this war? And uh, the answer is nobody. This, this war is going to be settled on the battlefield. And, and Gary, can you bring that last headline up, the, the one you just put up there? I, I, I found something really interesting about it. Uh, and, and, and that's how it's being portrayed. Okay, you can understand if Zelensky himself comes out and says this, but here's the, here's the independent. And it says Zelensky's latest shuffle has one major aim to project strength ahead of a tough winter for Ukraine. I, and I'm just wondering, how does anyone construe this as showing strength when you get rid of all of these senior cabinet officials? And, and to your point a second ago, you talked about how changing the, the general didn't make any difference to Sersky. Not only has it not made a difference, they've been losing ever since. They've been going backwards, so that one didn't project strength. But how does the West seem to always want to spin this in some kind of positive way for Ukraine? Well, the West is... Uh, in bed with Ukraine, and we're doing everything we can to make every move that Ukraine makes look good. That's the name of the game here. It, it's propaganda. 
there are two wars here. There's the real war on the battlefield, and then there's the propaganda war. And this is part of the propaganda war. And, you know, people in the West pay a lot of attention to these sorts of things, and they spend endless hours talking about what the consequences are and, and how this might improve uh, Ukraine's situation in the war. But in my opinion, it's a waste of time. The fact is, on the battlefield, the situation continues to deteriorate, and none of these moves make any difference. You know, I, I, I talk about things that don't make any sense and don't make any difference. Uh, I'm going to show you just a second a, a, a clip from Zelensky uh, where he's making a, a, a declaration. I think it was it was yesterday, yeah, uh, where he's going to tell people what he wants. But you talk about the difference between reality on, on the ground and, and the, the, the propaganda war. See how this fits into that category. Watch this. We continue to work with all partners for stronger decisions in support of our defense, for long-range decisions that would be able to destroy a significant part of Russian ballistics even before launch. This is one of the key issues of this war in general. The issue of our long-range capabilities and the corresponding permissions from our partners, long-range shells and missiles that we could use. Russian strikes will be impossible if it is possible for us to destroy the occupiers' launchers where they are, along with Russian military airfields and logistics. Providing Ukraine with such permissions and such weapons is definitely the biggest step towards a real, just end to this war. I mean, that, to suggest that all I need is literally every long-range missile in the entire Western ar 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 arsenals is not going to accomplish what he said there, which is to take out a significant portion of the Russian long-range missiles and their airfields and, and arms depots, et cetera. I mean, that's just absolute delusional. And yet, with a lot of conviction, he said it. I agree. Uh, I mean, we're not going to give them those weapons. Uh, we're not going to give them hardly any more weapons, in large part because we don't have them. Uh, and if we do give them to Zelensky, he's not going to be allowed to strike deep into Russia because our fear is that it will lead to escalation. The Biden administration, for all its faults, is fully aware that what Zelensky is doing here is trying to drag the Americans in. Zelensky really doesn't believe that these long-range missiles will have a military effect, that they will impact the battlefield in profound ways. He doesn't believe that. What he wants to do is strike deep into Russia so that the Russians retaliate in ways that get NATO into the fight. And then if you have a NATO-Russia fight, which is another way of saying, then if you have a U.S.-Russia fight, we're in the fight, Ukraine is taken care of. That's, that's his last hope at this point. Ukraine by itself, even with American weaponry or Western weaponry, can't rectify the situation on the battlefield. But it's a whole different ballgame if you talk about NATO and, again, the United States coming into the fight, actually putting boots on the ground and bringing in Western tactical aircraft. Uh, and that's what he's trying to do. The, the Biden administration is fully aware of this, and that's the last thing they want to have happen for obvious reasons. Well, if, if that's the last thing that the Biden administration wants to happen, what is the first thing that the administration wants to happen? Because it seems to me that it would be in our, our self-interest and in the Biden administration's self-interest to get this situation resolved and off the table so that he doesn't, he being Zelensky, doesn't take some sort of provocative action on the ground that could draw us in or that could spawn that kind of big response from the Russian side. So how does, how does the administration thread that needle? The administration has one main goal at this point in time, and that's to make sure that the Ukrainian military doesn't collapse before the November election. That's their principal goal. These people understand full well at this point that Ukraine is screwed, that there's no way the situation could be rectified. Uh, and uh, the only interesting question is how much territory the Russians are going to take and uh, the extent to which Ukraine has turned into a dysfunctional state. These are the interesting questions on the table, but they're not going to rectify the situation. The great fear is that the Ukrainian army might collapse before early November, and the end result will be very bad for the Biden administration and in particular for Kamala Harris. So that's what they're trying to head off now. 
and, and let's just play with that for a second. Do, do you see any course of action to where the Biden administration and then the Kamala campaign can take any action to bring this to, to, to lower the temperature, not just to hope nothing happens between now and November the 5th, but just could actually do something to, to mitigate things. Maybe have, do something like what they're doing with Israel, at least rhetorically, of saying, hey, we want you to move to a negotiated settlement. We think talks are the best way. Is there anything they can do, or will they literally just let it run on autopilot and hope nothing bad happens? Well, your question assumes that Putin's an idiot, right? You, you, you're assuming that the administration can bamboozle Putin into slowing down the offensive because we are really serious about negotiations. This is not going to happen. Putin doesn't trust us as far as he can throw us, right? He, he, he feels like he was bamboozled in the past and he's not going to trust us. And he's in the driver's seat now. Uh, the Russian steamroller is moving at a very nice pace uh, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and he'd be crazy uh, to take his foot off the pedal at this point in time. If anything, he should be pushing uh, the pedal even closer to the metal. He should be going to great lengths to finish off Ukraine as quickly as possible. I mean, that's what's strategically smart from his point of view. It's certainly not what we're hoping for, but from his point of view, that makes sense. And if the West, and here we're talking mainly about the Biden administration at this point, begins to talk about negotiations, he can say very clearly, here are the two conditions that I have put on the table that you have to agree to before I will negotiate. One is you have to accept the fact that I have uh, annexed uh, four oblasts in eastern Ukraine plus Crimea. And number two, you have to accept the fact, you have to formally accept the fact that Ukraine will not be part of NATO and it will be a neutral state. If you accept those two things, then I, Vladimir Putin, will negotiate with you. But as you well know, Danny, no president, certainly Joe Biden, is going to accept those two conditions. All of that just tells you negotiations are going nowhere. Well, that's that's what a, a reasonable and a rational thinking person would think. Uh, but uh, you, you mentioned a little bit what's happening on the battlefield. Let me jump to that a little bit because I, I want to kind of point out to some some real problems uh, here and it, sort of show people just what you're talking about. You talk about the steamroll. So first of all, and we're going to get to this in a second. This is the uh, the incursion up in the Kursk area where uh, on August the 6th, you know, we're closing in a now month, where uh, Ukraine initially made a lot of incursions and, and made, you know, kind of sprinted far and then tried, and now they're trying to hold on to what they have. And uh, here here lately, uh, and I think the last day or two, uh, other than a, a couple of Russian advances uh, and to try and take some of the territory back along the flanks here, uh, the Ukraine side has not been able to push any further, certainly not in any sizable area, yet they do have to continue to keep these supply lines open here to get people inside here. So it's it's very plain because I think after maybe the, the seventh or eighth day, there hadn't been any real advances here. So now then the question is, what next? What are you going to do with these guys? More on that in a second. But then now, even the even in the the north of the Kharkiv area, where the Russians made some incursions uh, a couple months back, and then kind of held on here, Ukraine still has to keep re, uh, reinforcing this area. So now then they're spread even thinner. Well, that's having an unpredictable impact over here in the Kupiansk area, where now Russia is making a couple of areas. Sorry, my map's not where we go. Uh, where Russia has made some advances up in this area, moving closer to a river line down here. They want to try the old school river. Uh, so they're making more uh, progress down there. And that's on top of the biggest issues, like in the in the uh, Pokrovsk area, where they're getting closer and closer, the Russians are, to this major uh, hub right here, which has seven rail and, and road lines, which is absolutely critical to supplying the Russian uh, Ukraine side all across the front line. In this area right here, there's a, a lot of Ukrainian troops that are uh, that are up fighting along the front here that the Russians are now starting to move around here and possibly even up here to get into a pincer to close them off. And that has just happened where the Ukraine side actually withdrew from a fairly large pocket, uh, not far from this area here in order to uh, avoid that, which has the effect that you're talking about kind of a steamroller. So they're continuing to move forward. Uh, and then that goes on for things down here in the bottom. But the bottom line is there is nothing, nothing militarily that would say any chance for Ukraine to reverse any of this, whether there's long range missiles or not. So it's, it's almost like it's a, 
a, a race against time for the for the Ukraine side. He can shuffle the, the people. He can fire generals uh, and he can claim he's going to get this stuff. But the Biden administration is not going to allow him to have those weapons that he wants. So the question is, what is going to happen? How, how can this play out over the next uh, whatever it is, eight or nine weeks? Well, I think that the Russian steamroller is going to continue to roll. Uh, I mean, you started by looking at the deployment of Ukrainian forces in the Kursk salient inside Mother Russia. And you made the point that it's pretty much uh, come to a standstill, which is correct. And as you well know, what happened uh, is that the Ukrainians took forces out of eastern Ukraine and moved them into the Kursk uh, offensive, right? They became part of the Kursk offensive. That weakened their troop levels in eastern Ukraine and has allowed the Russian steamroller to move faster than ever. Now, the question that the Ukrainians face is given that the Kursk salient is not expanding, things are at a standstill up there. Uh, do they maintain that salient? Do they put precious resources? Do they put reserves into the Kursk salient? Or do they send them to the Eastern Front? And the fact is that anything they send into the Kursk salient is taken away from the Eastern Front and just weakens their position there. At the same time, if they send more uh, troops and more equipment to places like Pokrovsk on the Eastern Front, that weakens their position in Kursk. The Ukrainians just don't have enough troops to fight on all these fronts. And, you know, if you go inside the Eastern Front, as you did, and you talk about the most northern part of that front versus the southern part and the central part of that front, what you discover very quickly is that the Ukrainians are being forced to shuffle troops back and forth uh, to various uh, flashpoints across the Eastern Front where they feel threatened. Uh, the fact is that they just don't have enough people. Some of the media accounts, and these are Western media accounts of what's going on in the Eastern Front, have Ukrainian troops saying that at the manpower level, they're outnumbered five to one. That's in terms of manpower. And we know that in terms of artillery, they're often outnumbered 10 to one. So they just stand hardly any chance of stemming the tide. This is the Ukrainians on the Eastern Front. And eventually the curse salient is going to be reduced. Uh, and at some point, the Ukrainian military uh, will either collapse or its leaders will recognize that continuing this fight is suicidal. And, you know, toward that end, you, you said, uh, you know, Zelensky is going to have to come to a decision pretty quick about the Kursk area. Uh, well, it turns out that he provided some of that information earlier today. Uh, NBC, actually, this was yesterday. I'm sorry. NBC News uh, is in Kiev right now and was asking some of the people of uh, of uh, Kiev what they thought about this Kursk in, in, uh, in, uh, incursion. And then they talked to Zelensky to ask him what's coming next. Interesting dynamic. Uh, this is from a Western person now uh, who normally is all in on all this, but even he's asking some pretty pointed questions. Watch this one. People on the streets are excited about that. It finally changed the narrative. It was a big morale boost for the population, for the military. But it has left people uh, scratching their heads as they ask, uh, which we, we asked President Zelensky, OK, now what? What's next? Now you've captured this territory in Russia. So the big question is, what do you plan to do with it? We don't need the Russian territory. Our operation is aimed to restore our territorial integrity. We capture Russian troops to replace them with the Ukrainian. We tell them, you know, we need our military soldiers in exchange with the Russian ones. The same attitude is to the territories. We don't need their land. Is the plan to take more territory? Or I will gonna... not tell. Uh, sorry, I can't. I can't speak about it. Yeah, I, I think he can't speak about it because he doesn't know. Uh, but interesting. In that same interview, he subsequently said that um, 
yeah, we're just going to hold on to it indefinitely. We're just going to hang on to it. So he actually did say a little bit there. And then now you see in, in the news today where he's again saying, yeah, we're just going to hold it indefinitely. But to your point there, I mean, you, you just described it perfectly. And by the way, I, what you described there was really reminiscent uh, of a lot of the study I had done uh, toward the latter phases of World War II when the, the Soviet Union was pushing the, the Germans back, and obviously the scale is substantially larger than this here, but that the, the German side was doing the same thing because they had lost so many of their trained and best personnel, and they were moving people from one part of the front to the next, and then this fire brigade thing, and it always caused more holes, and they just don't have enough to fight everywhere. And so you see that literally playing out before our very eyes. But the question is, there has to be an end game in this because you can't keep up the fiction that much longer. Yeah, the big difference between the end of World War II and what will be the end of this conflict is that in World War II, the Soviets drove into Berlin. And uh, of course, you had this giant pincer movement, which included the British and the Americans on one side and the Soviets on the other side. And uh, we completely destroyed Germany. Uh, and again, as I said, the Soviets went into Berlin and Hitler ended up killing himself in a bunker in April 1945. Uh, this war is, in my opinion, not going to end that way. Uh, or let me put it differently. It's extremely unlikely that this war will end up with uh, a catastrophic defeat for uh, Ukraine or a decisive defeat. Uh, I think the Russians will end up taking more territory than they control today, and they will go to greater lengths to wreck Ukraine to make sure it's a dysfunctional rump state. But I think Ukraine will still exist as a state, albeit a dysfunctional state, uh, in the future. Uh, so there's not going to be a decisive victory here. So the question is, how does it end? And as I said before, my best guess is that there are two ways it can end. One is the Ukrainian military just collapses uh, and the Russians grab some more territory. And then you have a negotiated settlement that leads to a frozen conflict. Uh, or the Ukrainian military does not collapse. It continues to fight. But its leaders and the political leaders understand that continuing this fight makes no sense. So they then negotiate some sort of settlement with the Russians. But the end result here is you're not going to get a permanent peace. You're going to get a frozen conflict. And this is going to lead to poisonous relations inside of Europe uh, and between Russia and the United States uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we made a catastrophic mistake by deciding to bring Ukraine into NATO and then not backing off when the Russians made it clear that they believed this was an existential threat and they would move heaven and earth to prevent it from happening. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it, it, it's just plain as day and right there for us to see in graphic detail. Uh, a lot of the wreckage is all over the Ukrainian battlefield. Uh, but you, you talked about the steamroller issue here and, and what's going forward. I, I want to slightly change track here and, and look on the uh, political slash diplomatic and economic tracks, because I think that just like the Ukraine side's losing on the battlefield, I think the Western side is losing on the diplomatic field, because obviously that one of the stated objectives at the very beginning of this war from the Western perspective was to harm Russia, to weaken them, to isolate them, to destroy their economy and all that kind of stuff. We've talked about the fact that the, the sanctions didn't work on the economy, but now it's much bigger than that. Uh, you have a lot of issues here coming up with the this BRICS meeting in Kazan, but it shows that, that Putin's, uh, um, his influence is expanding out. So we have, first of all, uh, he was actually in Mongolia, uh, where it was one of the big issues was Mongolia was, uh, uh, was one of those nations where it was a risk that Putin could be arrested uh, by the uh, International Criminal Court. I think it was it had a warrant out for him. And they not only did they not do it, uh, they actually had uh, an agreement where they have signed. And, uh, and it's especially important, I think, for for Mongolia uh, and all, to, to stand up to, to uh, the West because they have a lot to benefit from, as this report shows. The gas pipeline has been an issue Mongolia's long wanted. Uh, for Mongolia, it's pretty lucrative. You look at the stability of a of a natural fuel gas fuel source, uh, and then there's the 
tariffs that Mongolia could collect as this fuel tra travels over its territory. So that's good. The downside to that is definitely, well, Mongolia is going to be only more dependent on its Russian neighbor. If we look at trade, Russia is number two trade partner as far as imports into Mongolia goes. 70% of that is fuels, petrol fuels. And it's also highly dependent on Russia in those freezing months of December and January where Mongolia's own power grid is really getting to the upper limits of what it can actually produce. So, so that's with Mongolia. Instead of instead of like giving into the pressure that the West was putting on them to make good on this this uh, arrest warrant, then they're like saying, "Hey, my my train's tied here." Well, they're not the only ones. We also have Turkey has just agreed to seek formal introduction into BRICS. Uh, so you see him moving in that direction, and, and uh, Erdogan himself has said, "Hey, I just want to uh, expand. I want to reach out to everybody. I don't want. We're we're even still looking to the EU, et cetera. But it's making BRICS bigger. And so now then you you have China, uh, you have Serbia was making some public comments with with uh, Putin. Putin is showing that he can freely travel along these places, and he is anything but looking weak, especially as we get into BRICS. I wonder how important you think this BRICS meeting." could be uh what is the range of possibilities and what does that have to do with the west we'll stick with the first part first well i think that what's happening with BRICS and the fact that uh so many countries are excited about being members of BRICS, and the russians and the chinese are doing everything they can to cultivate and grow this particular international institution reflects the fact that there is a huge amount of both anger and dissatisfaction with American foreign policy. And it's not just Ukraine. And indeed, one could argue that it's the Middle East more than anything else uh, that is driving the train here. Uh, but the Chinese and, and the Russians view the United States as a mortal enemy, as they should, because the United States is a mortal enemy. And they want to create institutions that uh, are alternatives to Western institutions dominated by the United States. Therefore, you get BRICS. And then you have all these countries like Turkey, uh, a number of Muslim countries in Southeast Asia, uh, and so forth and so on, who are deeply angry at the United States for what's going on in Gaza the United States is complicit in a genocide. We are supporting the Israelis hook, line, and sinker. And this enrages huge numbers of people around the world, including government leaders like Erdogan. And that uh, causes leaders like Erdogan to want to distance themselves from the United States uh, and to join other institutions. Erdogan, in his case, wants to have the best of both worlds, right? He wants to remain in NATO. He wants to remain part of the West. But at the same time, he wants to join BRICS and cozy up to the Russians and the Chinese when he thinks it's in Turkey's interest. That's smart from his point of view. But from our point of view, this is all disastrous. Uh, our diplomatic or political position around the world uh, has deteriorated greatly since uh, the start of the Ukraine war, and even more so since October 7th, uh, when we began to back the Israel, the Israelis uh, unequivocally. And, and you know, let's let's stick on that topic for a second. Uh, Gary, we're able to pull that uh, that video up that I was wanting to look at there a second ago. Uh, because we, we, we actually played this on, on our previous show, but I think it's really important here because it, it, something you brought up and mentioned there is that this represents a, a basically a repudiation of much of the world of America's leadership. But instead of recognizing that, we seem to be doubling down on it or, or just oblivious to it. Here, here is Biden uh, earlier this year uh, talking about how he sees the United States as still the indispensable nation. Need just a minute, Danny. Let me uh, get oh. it. Oh, sorry about that. All right, I thought, thought we had it lined up there. I jumped the gun a little bit. Uh, we, we'll get to that clip in just a second, but it it just shows, and, and the context that we had talked about it previously was in the Middle East there, 
is that you have, you know, the United States and Biden a couple of days ago, you know, emphatically raising his fist and and saying, no, Netanyahu's not doing enough to get a ceasefire. We want a two state solution. We want a ceasefire. And, you know, we're going to do everything we can to have it. And then Netanyahu just publicly and embarrassing. He says, nobody is going to preach to me. Nobody is going to ask me to give in to anything. We're going to do what we need to do. And he's previously said, we'll tell our friends no and all this kind of stuff. So obviously shredding any evidence that the United States is running anything, even among our allies. Uh, but then as, as uh, this one shows that Gary has now, this is still how Biden thinks that we are. We don't walk away from our allies. We stand with them. We don't let tyrants win. We oppose them. We don't merely watch global events unfold. We shape them. That's what it means to be the indispensable nation. That's what it means to be the world's superpower and the world's leading democracy. Well, yeah, if we did that, that's what it would mean. But do you see any evidence that we do? No. I mean, all this rhetoric about us being the indispensable nation and doing good all around the world is just nonsense. I mean, anybody who looks at American foreign policy since the end of the Cold War understands pretty quickly that we've done a lot more damage than we've done good. Uh, I, I just don't know what he's talking about. Is he talking about the Iraq war? Is he talking about what happened in Afghanistan? Is he talking about what happened in Libya? Is he talking about what happened in Syria? Is he talking about what happened in Ukraine? Is he talking about what we're doing with regard to Gaza? I mean, you just wonder what world he's living in. But he's reflective of the overall elite. I mean, he's not an anomaly. They're just all sorts of people in the Republican Party, you know, people like Lindsey Graham and in the Democratic Party, people like President Biden uh, and Kamala Harris, who all believe that, uh, you know, we are uh, uh, we are responsible for running the world. We have a moral responsibility to do that. Uh, we certainly have a right to do it. Uh, and uh, and we have to do it because. People around the world need American leadership. Without American leadership, the world would go to hell in a handbasket. Uh, I just find it hard to believe that anybody can take that argument seriously. But as you know, most of our fellow Americans at the elite level uh, have drunk the Kool-Aid and they believe that. But as you point out, outside of the United States, they don't believe that. So this trend, so this is, okay, so this, whatever's going to happen in Kazan is, is going to expand BRICS by some number. It's, it's unclear how far that's going to be, uh, but it, it's not going to be like this earthquake change, but it's going to be moving in the direction of, of maybe basically having multiple poles as opposed to the United States being the, the central driver. Where can this go? And, and what, what the, are the risks to the United States either economic or national security uh, as a result of these things. Could it get, how bad could it get is a better question. Well, the thing you want to remember, Danny, is that the reason we're allowed to pursue these uh, remarkably foolish policies is because we're so powerful. The United States remains the most powerful state on the planet. And that means that there are limits to how much damage we can do to ourselves and their limits to how much resistance others can put up against us. I'm not saying that they can't cause us a lot of trouble, the Russians and the Chinese and others. They can cause us a lot of trouble for sure. But there are limits, again, because we are so powerful. Nevertheless, if you're in a, a world where you're competing with the Chinese and you're competing with the Russians, as we are, uh, what happens on the margins does matter. Uh, and uh, the United States does want to have good diplomatic relations with countries all over the planet. It has a deep-seated interest in having a peaceful Middle East. Uh, and, uh, and it has a deep-seated interest in putting an end to the war in Ukraine. Uh, so everything that we do in a blunderpuss kind of way that gets in the way of achieving those goals causes us trouble and limits the effectiveness of our foreign policy. And that's where we are. And we are in a heap of trouble. But again, the fact that the United States is so powerful 
And given its geographical location on the planet, you know, we're separated from all the other great powers from two giant o- by two giant oceans. We have weak neighbors. We have a remarkably strong economy. We have lots of people. Uh, there are just limits to how much damage we can inflict on ourselves. Now, here's here's one of the areas that concerns me. Uh, <laughs> it, we could inflict more damage on ourselves if we take some truly catastrophic decisions if things go bad. My big concern, and I want to ask you how concerned you are of it, is if in the, the scenario you drew a second ago, one of the possibilities was that the Ukraine army collapses. And if they literally just completely collapse and then just break and rush, especially because they apparently they have some uh, strategic reserves uh, of some size where they could literally start rolling through any gaps that may be created, uh, is that you could have a, a, a literal loss uh, on the Ukraine side. Or there would be the, the prospect of it. And then you have on the Western side the risk of trying to stop that by either directly intervening uh, or to take some other kind of foolish action, which the Russians have said, don't do it because your oceans won't protect you in that. Do you see a risk that the U.S. in the event of a Ukrainian collapse could do something stupid? Or would we finally admit that we have reached the end of the road and accept a loss? Let's unpack this a bit. I think if the Ukrainian military collapsed, uh, in, in, we're talking mainly about eastern Ukraine here, and the Russians rolled to the Dnieper River uh, and they basically stopped, except for maybe in the Kherson area where they uh, took back the rest of Kherson. And the end result, which is on the other side of the Dnieper, the result of that would be that the Russians had have basically gained full control of the four oblasts uh, that they have now annexed. It's very important to emphasize to readers that the Russians have annexed four oblasts, but they do not control the territory that's included in all four of those oblasts. So let's assume that they do uh, capture all that territory and stop there. I think at that point, there's virtually no chance uh, the West and here we're talking mainly about the United States, would come into the fight. But let's assume the collapse is so complete that the Russians are able to take all the territory in those four oblasts, and then they begin to move into the next four oblasts that are to the west of those four they've already annexed. And this would involve uh, oblasts like Odessa and Kharkiv. And they take those, or they try to take those oblasts, and it looks like they're making good progress. If you're in this scenario, I think the temptation for the Americans to come in would be significant, but I still think we would not come in. Uh, And I think the Russians would make it clear uh, that their appetite is limited. They They may take more territory, they may take Odessa, they may take Kharkiv, and maybe two other oblasts, but there would be uh, powerful incentives for them to tell the West that that would be the end. Uh, And I don't think we would come in, but I do think we would be tempted and I can't be certain that we wouldn't intervene. But you want to remember, if we intervene, you now have a great power war, right? You have the United States and Russia involved in a war. We have boots on the ground. We have tack air inside of Ukraine. And this is not just two great powers who are at each other's throat. This is two great powers. This is a case of two great powers armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons who are at each other's throat. And the conflict is being fought out on Russia's border. It's being fought out in an area that Russia thinks is of existential importance to it. So you could imagine in that scenario where the Russians would be tempted to use nuclear weapons if they were losing in any meaningful way to the West. Uh, All of this is to say this is an incredibly dangerous situation. And I think, therefore, we would not enter the fray, even if the Russians try to capture more territory than those four oblasts that they've already annexed. You know, I, uh, <laughs> a good portion of me, if that scenario were to take place, would it, it, at least hope that it's on the other side of the election? Because if it's on this side of the election, 
then the pressure would be even greater because just imagine if the Biden administration acknowledged that we had we couldn't intervene, so we can't stop Russia from taking this territory. That'll, of course, be extended over to Kamala Harris because she's trying to take over his reins. And so that would be, of course, exploited by the Republican side. So those political pressures in the United States would add to the danger uh, because what we should do is exactly what you suggested. We should probably have done a lot of other things uh, even now. But in that environment, the absolute number one overriding Im imperative is do not go to war against a nuclear power Russia over something like Ukraine. It should never happen that we would risk our soldiers or our cities to such a, an outcome. Let me just say, I, I hadn't thought of the point you made just now, but it's a very important point. If if you if the Ukrainian military collapses before the election and the Russians quickly take back the territory that encompasses those four oblasts that they do not now control, and they begin to move into Odessa and so forth and so on, the pressure on the Biden administration to move uh, to save Kamala Harris in the uh, election would be very great. Uh, it would be uh, much different uh, if the Ukrainian military collapsed after the election, right. uh, assuming that Kamala Harris had been elected in, in early November. Yeah, the election does matter here. It truly does. And we'll be seeing how this plays out there. But uh, uh, as always, we're very, very grateful for you coming on today. And uh, re remind folks to to go to see uh, your Substack because, uh, you know, you got a lot of inform interesting information here. You're on lots of other great shows. And so people who don't get enough, you need to go to your Substack there uh, and follow what John has. And we'll, of course, as always, look forward to having you back on our show here. Not too far. I look forward to coming back, Danny. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much.